So welcome everybody. This is again uh, a recap of Black Hat 2024. Happened last week. We're all just still recovering, but uh, welcome and uh, really looking forward to our conversation today. Uh, I'm going to introduce our uh, panelists today. Our just our our uh, folks who are here to talk about it with us. But before that, let's just have a quick recap of Reversing Labs, just in case you're not aware of what we do here at uh, RL. Uh, we're basically a very um, well-known trusted authority in software and file security. So we've been, Versing Labs has been around for 15 years, uh, and we are, uh, you know, the owners of basically the largest threat repository, uh, private or public, uh, with about 40 billion files, both malware and goodware. And uh, it's a number that obviously is growing by the day uh, as we find and analyze more uh, files. Um, and that is a, a huge resource for us that we use to help understand the sort of shape and nature of, you know, malware and attacks. Uh, and it's something that we provide as a resource to uh, 60 of the leading cybersecurity companies out there, um, whether it's EDR companies or, or what have you. Um, we're kind of a, a company that is key uh, technology provider to other cybersecurity companies. So your company may, your organization may already be using Reversing Labs technology and just not know about it. Um, we uh, have a channel program. We've received a lot of accolades for our channel partner program. Uh, and we've been recognized recently by Gartner as a leading uh, player in the software su supply chain security play, uh, space. And uh, we were a data contributor this year to the uh, data breach investigation report by um, Verizon. Uh, so just stuff to know about us as a company. We really uh, we're using that threat file threat intelligence to really help companies both address, you know, malware threats, but also understand supply chain risk. And we'll talk about that a little bit today as well. Okay. Uh, check us out at reversinglabs.com. Okay. With us here to talk about Black Hat 2024, really happy to have two very uh, well-respected and renowned researchers uh, and uh, experts. Um, Patrick Wardle is uh, the CEO and co-founder of the firm W, as well as founder of the nonprofit known as the Objective C Foundation, that's S-E-E. -E. And he's the author, as I said, of The Art of Mac Malware, it's a new book series. Um, Patrick's background is working in NASA and the NSA, and he is um, been presenting on cybersecurity issues for a long time uh, and at many conferences, including this year's Black Hat, and we're going to talk about his talk there. Um, he is an expert in the cybersecurity risks of uh, Apple's Mac OS, uh, and he has just exposed numerous weaknesses and flaws over the years uh, in Mac OS, including O'Day's mal, you know, Mac OS specific malware. Uh, and he's published a range of free and open source security tools uh, to help you protect uh, your Mac systems. Uh, and those are you know available online. Um, and given his expert in uh, his background uh, in the uh, government, intimately familiar with alien spies and talking nerdy. Patrick, welcome. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> stoked to be here. <laughs> I'm stoked to be here too. I, I we haven't had the UAP conversation though, but I feel like maybe we should in person. <laughs> Suddenly, attendance balloons to thirty thousand. <laughs> Some extraterrestrials, you know, jump in. <laughs> All right. And uh, along with Patrick, we have Dennis Keyes, who's a researcher with the focus uh, on the security and privacy of IoT devices, very noted um, researcher on Internet of Things devices. He is passionate about physical security and lock picking, and that's, we're going to talk about that today. And he enjoys applied research and reverse engineering malware and all kinds of devices. Uh, his most known projects are the documentation of um, and, and hacking of the workings of uh, vacuum robots. Um, he calls himself the robot collector and his current vacuum robot army consists of uh, more than 60 different models from various vendors. Uh, there we go, he's got, he's got one right with him. Um, and he's published a whole bunch of tools and resources for folks who are owners of vacuum robots that allow you to kind of liberate those and um, you know control them, modify them, tweak them. 
Uh, and he's made a lot of those tools available to the public. Some of them have tens of thousands of users. Um, uh, he's talked about his research at a number of different conferences, including the Chaos Communication Congress, Recon, DEF CON, mm. NullCon, uh, Hardware.io, yeah? Mm. Yeah. I did the workshop there about Amazon Echoes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dennis, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for the Great invite. to have you. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's move on here to uh, to our conversation. I thought um, here's just a kind of general overview of the discussion. And um, to start off with, I thought first of all, each of you had a uh, talk or numerous talks at uh, Hacker Summer Camp. So I thought I'd just enlighten our uh, our attendees. Have you kind of do a quick kind of recap of what your own particular talk was about and uh and we can we can dig into that and then we're going to talk about some of the bigger themes that were that were out there that we that we observed um patrick i'll start with you you talked at black hat and uh your talk was on well first of all we didn't we did a reversing labs book club interview in the in the booth but aside from that you had a really interesting talk on um analyzing uh os uh, mac os uh, crash reports for kind of information indications of whether there's a compromise or malware running on the device um so just kind of give us an overview of that talk and how that idea came to you and and kind of what the takeaways are for sure so to start you know crash reports are the operating system files that are created when a program crashes uh, you know, developers are intimately familiar with them. We, you know, write software. Unfortunately, if it has a bug, it can generate a crash. And this will have the information that tells us what went wrong. So that's well understood. But what I wanted to look at and really talk about was that these crash reports actually hold a myriad of incredibly useful data, not just for developers, but for security researchers, uh, you know, malware analysts, and even in some cases, hackers or intelligence agencies. Uh, so first we have to understand how to read a crash report. It's a little bit, uh, you know, designed for the computer end or the developer. So we have to walk through and figure out, you know, what a stack backtrace is, talk about mm -hmm. the halting instruction, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And once we have an, an understanding of that, which I went through in the talk, we can now start reading these report. So what I did was really just use my computer uh, and when things would crash, I would grab the crash reports and try to figure out what was there. And I really found a whole bunch of interesting stuff. So uh, some of the malware analysis I do on a VM would trigger crashes. The idea there is that malware is often not written as well as say operating system vendor logic or, or programs. And so if malware is crashing, you know, this is now leaving a, a trace that perhaps something uh, is amiss because in the crash report, it's like the path to the file that crashed and also the reason. So if we're, we're looking at the crash reports, maybe we can uncover malware that previously we didn't know. And there are some precedents for this. The malware known as Stuxnet, which many of you are probably familiar with, was actually originally detected when it started crashing computers. So one of the takeaways was, you know, crash reports can reveal malware. Similarly, or at least relatedly, is crash reports also can show you if there are failed exploitation attempts. The reasoning behind this is that, uh, especially nowadays, a lot of exploits are memory corruption vulnerabilities that aren't 100% reliable. So if someone's trying to perhaps remotely infect you, uh, we see adversaries doing this with, for example, iOS zero clicks and all sorts of other neat vulnerabilities. While those exploits don't aren't successful 100% of the time, the percentage of the time they fail to actually generate crash reports. So what we are now starting to do is collect these crash reports and figure out that, you know, if we look at this, we can again figure out what went wrong and we can see, oh, actually, you know, someone was trying to uh, exploit that. And again, this has been done for a while, maybe on other operating systems. I know Microsoft does this and they had some really interesting research where they uncovered zero day vulnerabilities, uh, flaws that adversaries were using that nobody else knew about that were able to target and infect any versions of Windows at the time. And, you know, because of the exploit failing one or two times and Microsoft being able to get the crash reports, Microsoft was able to uncover the flaw that previously nobody knew about and patch the system. So I'm sure the attackers were super super bummed, but you know, for Microsoft and their users, they were very, very stoked again, thanks to, to crash reports. And, and then finally, I looked at 
just crash reports on my Mac OS system and iOS devices. And I uncovered some really interesting things. There was uh, one of my favorites. There was a, a bug in iOS where Apple was actually trying to censor the Taiwanese flag on iPhones that had uh, a Chinese locale. And this was wow. a demand from the Chinese government that Apple had ac acquiesced to, but their implementation had a flaw. And in certain cases, you could text someone at Taiwanese flag and it would crash their device. Um, you know, you couldn't like take over the device, but from the crash report, I was able to confirm the bug, but also essentially reveal that yes, Apple was, you know, uh, at the time acquiescing to the demands of the Chinese government, which I think is the bigger takeaway. And in my personal opinion is uh, rather inexcusable, especially for a company that claims to be, you know, all about its, uh, its users. So that again, from a crash report. And then more recently, some of the crash reports that were happening on my Mac actually revealed flaws in even the most recent versions of Mac OS. I write a lot of security tools and sometimes my security tools, uh, you know, are using legitimate documented APIs, but maybe those APIs aren't tested as well by Apple. You know, there's not that many people writing security tools. And so what I found was sometimes my security tools would inadvertently crash or reveal a flaw in Mac OS. And it wasn't like my code was at fault or was broken. It was that these Apple APIs just really hadn't been tested as well by Cupertino as perhaps they, they should have. In that case, you know, uh, revealed some really interesting bugs. Probably the most interesting one was that uh, unprivileged malware could actually unload trusted security tools by basically saying sending a malformed request to a system daemon that was processing security tools, it would crash the daemon and the daemon then would take down any other security tool. So again, this is something that malware could potentially abuse to uh, yeah. unload and bypass security things. So that was kind of an interesting uh, piece. And then the last part of the talk was just talking about the CrowdStrike fiasco and how by analyzing crash reports from uh, Windows machines that had crashed, we could a point out that this really was a CrowdStrike bug. You know, initially, I mean, it's well understood now, but initially, uh, Microsoft was getting blamed. People were seeing Microsoft systems crashing, so they were saying it's a Microsoft bug. But no, the crash report showed that it was actually a CrowdStrike issue. And then from the crash report, we could figure out exactly what was wrong, went wrong, which again was important because there was a lot of misinformation. People jumping to wild claims about you know, why it crashed and what the bug was. And well, the answer was actually in the crash report. So, you know, the talk again focused on how to read those and really, I think, drove home the point that these crash reports are uh, a source of absolute truth and also incredibly valuable for not just developers, but security tool developers, operating system vendors, uh, malware analysts, and in some cases, even hackers and adversaries who are uh, you know, poking around looking for vulnerability. So that's a nutshell, kind of a, a deep dive into what I talked about. And really, again, the goal was to hopefully get lots of people falling in love with crash reports and realizing how valuable they are. Yeah. Um, were there were there substantive differences between the way Microsoft does crash reports and Apple? I know you're you're when you did the the um, CrowdStrike thing, you were like, you know, this is I'm not I'm not used to working on Windows <laughs> as much, but I'm going to take yeah. a swing here. Um, any uh, any advantages to the way Microsoft does crash reports or Apple, um, or are they pretty similar? Yeah, good question, Paul. And uh, the reason I like to talk about this is, you know, at the conceptual level, they're pretty similar, meaning that these crash reports are generated again when a program or application or even the operating system crashes. And there's going to be differences between Windows and Apple. Um, you know, basically the operating system has some differences. But both of the crash reports on Windows and on Mac are going to have things like a stack backtrace shows like the sequence of calls that got to the faulting instruction. The faulting instruction is, you know, the last line of code, the last assembly instructions, binary instructions that the CPU executed that triggered the crash. And, you know, then there'll be the exception codes, thread state registers, blah, blah, blah. But the idea is conceptually they're very similar. So that is even though I predominantly only do Apple <clears throat> research when CrowdStrike uh, crashed and happened, I was able to kind of 
pop over to Windows and, and dig around. And there was so much overlap there that uh, I was able to gain a lot of in insight into what went wrong um, even before Microsoft or CrowdStrike had pushed out other information. Very cool. Okay, Dennis, you um, you were a uh, you didn't speak at Black Hat, but you were there at Black Hat, um, and uh, but you did have two talks at the DEF CON uh, hacker conference, kind of Black Hat's sister <clears throat> conference. Uh, actually, predates Black Hat, but um, and um, really interesting talks. One on the Ecovax uh, vacuum robot. Uh, AK, you know, kind of low key surveillance tool, not so low key surveillance tool that you talked about. The other one on DigiLock, and that uh, that got a little bit of uh, attention uh, because of kind of what went down uh, leading up to the talk. Um, give us a quick uh, overview of those two uh, presentations and kind of what what uh, what gave birth to them, how they came to be. Um... By the way, fun fact, my dog just crashed. So I, if I'm looking down, it's like because I need to look at my laptop. Uh, so yeah, uh, the um, so I have two talks. There's a, there's uh, a crash report waiting for you, Dennis. Yeah, probably it's Windows. I use Windows. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, the first talk was about uh, Equivox uh, robots generally. So um, it's not only vacuum robots, but it's also like um, lawn mowing robots. So they nowadays have like lawn mowing robots. These were the ones which we were actually talking about CES this in the beginning of the year, where we got the worst kind of privacy award. For it, I think. Yes. Um, so yeah, so the idea was basically, so I was looking at other vendors like over the last five, six years uh, or seven years by now. Um, and so I was looking at Xiaomi, I was looking at uh, Roborock, Dreamy, I was looking at some point also um, at uh, iRobot, um, but I think they're not relevant anymore. Um, and some other companies. And at some point, I mean, um, um, Equivax was one of the few companies uh, which produces um, um, lawn mowing robots and this also producing uh, vacuum robots so we took a look at them and we figured out the software is like horribly bad it's like I mean um, they collect lots of telemetry lots of data which is stored on the device it's never deleted even if you do a factory reset the data is not encrypted um, they think it's optional to check SSL certificates in their app and on their device which is maybe not the best idea and they leak the OAuth token so you can access devices remotely um and we found like a thing where you could access the camera of a, of a user remotely and typically they say like oh it's not a big issue because you need to know the pin um but turns out that the pin verification to access the remote camera on the vacuum robot um was implemented on a client side in the app so it was basically honest based authentication or honor based authentication so um if we as attackers if we steal someone's OAuth token over because we're in the same wi-fi um we can you know just patch this pin verification function out of our own app so the robot doesn't care if you enter the right pin or not it, basically the app of the user cares um but you can just man manipulate so we don't we ne <laughs> don't necessarily care about that i uh, would try to patch it um but you can just downgrade and so we never patch actual firmware so we only patch like the plugin on the client side again um i, I mm. don't know uh and we found uh ble remote code execution actually uh, quite a while ago already um when we were initially giving a talk in germany like half a year ago we didn't release it because we thought like ah eh, it might hurt people um and the way how it works is basically you can um generate a payload uh and you can send it just completely unauthenticated uh to any echovex robot in your proximity which has bluetooth on and typically you know lawnmowers have it on and um vacuum robots have it on in particular circumstances um, and the payload will fire and it will just execute any command you want as root. So you can download like a dropper onto the robot. Um, you can do other things. You can access cameras, microphones, um, you know, whatever you want. Uh, and these devices are kind of powerful. So the lawnmower has like an octa core uh, thing, eight gigabyte of RAM or four gigabyte of RAM. So like it's it's basically it's there the whole time. Um, the reaction of Equivox was kind of interesting. So even this topic blew up after the TechCrunch article. And Echoex said, like, oh, yeah, it's a super complicated attack, which, you know, just requires a phone uh, with, like, the Nordic NF, uh, uh, NRF app installed. Um, and we won't fix it because it's, like, it's 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 not a big, big deal. <laughs> and, yeah, I'm still I'm still um, amazed about that. Because so one of the attack ideas which we had to be tested that in a way, uh, I mean, I have, like, from Echovex, like, 10, 10 robots by now, 10, 11, actually. Um, and uh, you can you can create a worm with that. So the thing is, like uh, on the vacuum robot, we have uh, a cool Python environment installed. So you can, you know, as soon as you take over one robot, you can just literally use the tools on the robot to jump on the other devices. And that robot is obviously in someone else's Wi-Fi, right? So you can also mess 
stuff from there and you have to wi-fi credentials you have pictures you have access to microphones and cameras so uh i, I see it as a problem uh but apparently ecovax doesn't so i guess um wow i might be wrong here yeah. um yeah you're you're probably wrong there yeah <laughs> i know uh and so uh the uh um our other talk was uh um about smart lockers and smart locks um so one thing which we did is uh, there so we took keyless keyless locks basically yeah like digital so, so... locks yeah yeah, so you have basically stuff like that, you know, you, you um, where you enter a pin, um, you know, this is like two, this is American, this is German, so these are the two market leaders, um, and uh, yeah, so the basic idea is, uh, and it's not necessarily, so, uh, and I feel many people misunderstood what the actual problem here was, I mean, the problem is obviously that, you know, you can open lockers, you can um, extract a master key from a lock in one location, so if you're, like, if you're in the gym, you can extract the master key from one lock and just open all the other locks and relock them again. But that's not necessarily the issue in the sense of like, you know, if someone steals stuff. But the more problematic part is um, what we found with ourselves is um, if you go, to like, let's say, for uh, into a library or like a company and you put your stuff into a locker and you lock it with like a pin that you can freely choose, how likely is that whatever pin you set on the lock is the same? that is all the stuff which is inside the locker like your atm card here you know phone and everything and so our idea here was basically like oh okay i mean we can we can open lockers very easily so you just need like a you know uh basically flipper with like a pogo needles and like a some kind of magic word uh but but the thing is you can leverage your attack from a locker to other things because uh, uh some lockers use an rfid for authentication so we can you know clone like extract rfid keys uh, or the RFID ID depends on you know the vendor um, and clone like the card and just go to the next server room and just tap in or you can you know like I said unlock your Windows computer like with Windows Hello or I don't know how it works with Macs I don't have a Mac uh, if you have like a pin function or something you know it's like generally people entrust uh, secrets uh, to the to like devices which we're not expecting you know to be problem problem and it doesn't only apply for for you know lockers but generally if you think about more broad I mean you have garage door openers you know there's some other things you know like with the pin so they are which are accessible from outside so there's a lot of places out there where you might be um, you know using the same pin which you use for our more lo secure locations you know your house door and uh, versus not me I don't do that sure I mean I do to be fair I did it for a long long time until I did the research I was like oh no yeah right. um so uh yeah so there's like a couple of tags I mean it's not only Digilog there's many many other uh, companies uh yeah. like SAG uh from uh, like uh Schulte, Schlagbaum, AG and like this you know all the cheap Chinese locks have the same issue there's like many 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 locks out there um and I mean they're not safe locks right so I mean I'm not expecting like super security from there um but the reaction of Digilog was kind of special um in a way I mean we talked to them like in March back then and kind of said like hey um you know we have this issue um the way also how we got to them was like interesting so typically you would expect to go to a website you find an email address you, you sent them an email like hey I have a bug and you know this is the problem uh we didn't have that so there's no email address there so in the end when I was giving a talk in Berlin in Germany um the way how I got to them is um I use the chat function on my website, you know, like this weird kind of chat bot in the, in the right corner or like of a website. And it was like literally like, hey, I have a vulnerability I would like to report. Can you connect me with someone? And we're like, oh, yeah, you can just report it here. I mean, we're a very good support team. I was like, all right, the talk is in three days. Uh, lot, back, yeah. Yeah, back, back, in, uh, like in, back in March, right? So the talk is like in three days or whatever. I, uh, I'm desperate now. And it actually worked. I mean, this was the first time in my life where actually a chat bot or like a chat function on a website was actually uh, doing something, something useful. Um, but yeah, so um, they uh, um, so they knew for, for that like for quite a while, and when we were giving a DEF CON talk this year, or like re like last week, uh, basically one of the wired reporters reached out to them, and I think it got them a little bit spooked, um, and they tried to pull a cease and desist like the day before the talk. Um, and as, as someone who maybe looked at Wikipedia about DEF CON and like Black Hat, uh, you might figure out that typically uh, doing a cease and desist at DEF CON and Black Hat method and very well in sense of like you know people it it it, act, it it attracts more attention that than you want to have um and i think the general plan was to kind of squash the problem because if no one knows knows about the problem it doesn't exist uh but that kind of backfired right. a little bit um so generally i mean uh, we moved to talk to sunday uh we were uh talking uh, with them i mean they kind of indirectly told us like hey um you know a lot of customers are kind of contacting them now like hey what the heck is going on with the logs um the um the from from the lawyers so I had the feeling so 
the EFF basically helped me to kind of squash the problem. So they kind of took over like in half an hour, literally like, I think we got a season. This is at 2 p at 2 p.m. Uh, and at 2 30, we were sitting in a car to to the hotel to, to one of the lawyers and we were already starting to discuss the, the issue. So it was a super, super quick thing. Uh, but so we decided to move the talk from Friday um, to Sunday to give like more time. Um, and I think in my personal opinion, I mean, all the things which were claimed there, there was like some uh, computer fraud and abuse act for offline logs, which are not connected to the internet. There were like a lot of like other things where, I mean, you know, as a German, I mean, I did a lot of research in Germany. We can, in Germany, it's totally legal to reverse engineer uh, things, you know, pull secrets out of stuff if I don't have a license agreement with you. Right? So that's a kind of requirement. And about all the logs of eBay. So, I mean, I didn't have any, you know, legal um, right. thing with the company. Uh, yeah, and I mean, in the end of the day, I think they kind of realized very quickly that the cease and desist was kind of like not a good idea. And uh, we were like, hey, we're a small company. And I mean, I tried to help them, right? I mean, the thing is like uh, we omitted some technical details from the thing, so you cannot just walk out and just do it uh, in like five minutes. Um, but if you have a problem, you have a problem, right? It's like, you know, let's fix it. And you could, they had like, you know, since March to kind of kind of squash down the problem and they started to do it right now. So it's kind of like uh a problem i think the big problem generally with physical security companies is that they don't um, especially the ones which are existing for a very very long time so um the um uh, digioc exists i think since uh, 1981 or something and the other company uh, uh should the schlag bomb exists since 1833 right so it's like a very very old companies wow. who come from mechanical locks um, and they don't realize that they're basically now uh, embedded systems companies or iot companies right so it's kind of like a thing where uh, the old rules of like secrecy for like a patents and everything doesn't, doesn't apply software is king. Right. So it's kind of like, um, I think this yeah. is like a thing which we need to push in the industry a little bit like, Hey, yes. uh, you, you guys are those software companies. Right. I think that brings up, I mean, I think moving on to sort of what some of the big themes at black hat and DEF CON were, I mean, I think that Dennis, your talks, uh, hit on one of them, which is this kind of issue with software risks in embedded devices and in firmware. And there were there were definitely another a couple other talks uh, at DEF CON, one on um, uh, exploiting flaws in um, this AMD technology that is uh, on uh, chips. Uh, and there was another one about um, exploiting Mac uh, Apple's new USB C uh, controller, which, you know, from reading the description of the talk, I actually didn't see this talk. Um, Patrick, I don't know, maybe you did, but um, sounds like Apple did a lot of work to try and kind of harden that interface. Um, and yet they were able to kind of uh, exploit it too. Um, what, you know, what is the message to um, companies uh, out there around these firmware risks? Um, because this this does seem like Dennis, your talk point out like there's a really scary level of disengagement often on the part of the device makers around you know the risks like, even for connected internet connected devices, remotely accessible devices, uh, a real lack of awareness, kind of orientation around cyber risks. So. Um, man, how are, how are organizations supposed to deal with that? I think the problem is generally that they don't. So for many, many years, and if I look at Digilog, I mean, this, they had this problem for 32 years, right? And, and many other companies had this problem also for many, many, every, uh, so for a long time. And the problem with, especially if you talk about embedded devices, is it's very, very difficult to kind of uh, look into them. And I mean, Patrick can look into, you know, um, um, crash dumps of like Mac computers, right? But I mean, what happens if a software crashes on an IoT device? I mean, maybe the vendor gets that, but the vendor gets like so many of them, so they don't, most of the time don't care. Um, one thing which I see quite often is like, okay, if the product is working, just, just uh, generally push it out. Um, on the other side, you have companies like Apple who kind of try to squash uh, problems. And I mean, I think the talk by Thomas about the um, uh, USB controller uh, kind of shows you that it, it it raises the bar very, very high. I mean, he had like to to use like ten thousands of dollars of equipment. Uh, I mean, I know Thomas personally so, uh, to kind of do some uh, side channel stuff and to do some some fault injection. And it's not a attack. It's an impressive attack generally, but it's not an attack which you know uh, you can mass take over phones right now. Um, it's, it's like a lot of effort, which you need to put in because the companies kind of got uh, a little bit annoying, annoyed by, uh, you know, researchers. So they kind of try to crack down on that. So they put a lot of effort into that and it raises the bar very, very high. So I feel generally we have two sides of like, um, problems, like the super trivial ones where you can, you know, you just like a, 
uh, $25 uh, debugger, um, or you um, have like this other stuff where you need to do fault interaction, where you need to kind of build like, you know, your own kind of, kind of, kind of probes to kind of, you know, glitch things to, to, to glitch the, you know, firmware verification function. And so it's, it's kind of moves more or less like to, to these both like poles, basically that, you know, you have like the super trivial ones and you super complicated ones uh, in regard to embedded systems nowadays. Yeah. I like what Dennis uh, said, because that's, you know, really the, current situation where a uh, one end, you know, IOT devices often are maybe somewhat softer targets. Uh, and that's not to take away from the hacks and research because oftentimes these IOT devices are, you know, the robots that are running around their houses that no one's suspecting. And so, you know, um, hackers and, and nation states are equally interested in those maybe even more so than, you know, hacking computers, you know, because I know that, you know, my Mac is maybe a target. I can, but, you know, I can see what's running on it. I can see illicit running processes. Mm -hmm. I can run antivirus software. I can look at network traffic. You know, like my <laughs> my vacuum robot, which I might throw out now, <laughs> thanks to Dennis, <laughs> recycle. You know, I have no idea if it's been compromised. And if so, Just like- Go to, go to Dennis's, go to don'tvacuumme.com, don'tvacuum.me, man. <laughs> donate, all donate, kinds of, all donate, kinds of tools, him. man. Um, yeah. But I did love the Apple research uh, that Thomas did because I think exactly like Dennis said, it showed that, you know, Apple, kind of the other end of the spectrum, introduced all these, you know, very- um, all these defense in depth mechanisms where I believe yeah. like, you know, part of the, the stuff was like personalized. And so it made reverse engineering exploits a lot more difficult, but it did still show that a competent research with uh, a budget, let's just say still would be able to uh, overcome that. And that's kind of the challenge that a lot of companies face is that it's a cat and mouse game and the attacker only has to find one way in, whereas the, mm -hmm companies. But that having been said, I think it's the same with securing an operating system, right? You mm -hmm. just want to always raise the bar. You want to add for a network. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exploitation mechan anti-exploitation mechanisms. You want to add, you know, additional stuff to make it very difficult. Even if at the end of the day, a very specialized adversary might, might still be able to do that. So yeah. I think that's the takeaway and that's not that companies should give up and not do anything, but you know, if they do the basics, uh, I really like Dennis's research because it really showed like a lot of these companies aren't even like doing the basics and, you know, yeah. optionally validating <laughs> certificates. It's like, what? This is 2024. Like, that's insane. Um, right. You know, the diverse part of this whole thing, by the way, with the robots is that they got a certificate, a security certification. We got certified by TÜV Rheinland and they have like, uh, they say that they um, are compliant against, uh, against Etsy and ISO 27000 and stuff like that. Um, I think one of the things which is kind of important, I think, in regard also to Thomas' uh, work, um, it's it's, uh, and this is like very easy for me, so it's a little bit unfair. Uh, so mo most companies don't realize as soon as you have physical, as soon as I can touch your lock, right? As soon as I can touch the, your device, uh, if I'm motivated and have, uh, I wouldn't say unlimited money, but uh, some some amount of money, your device is broken, like like nearly always. Uh, it's like very very hard to find like devices which um which resist physical attacks and um so um there's like just two sides right i mean uh and for patrick so just to make sure that you don't leave your macbook out of uh, sight when you're at the airport and everything because then you most of the time you're fine right but uh as soon as someone has some kind of physical access um it uh, the uh, it becomes way way more complicated to kind of defend things um and that's one of the reasons you know generally don't give your keys away like rfids and stuff don't give your phone out of your hand don't give your laptop out of your hand uh don't give your vacuum robot out of your hand because uh, right. like physical attacks, um, you know, uh, the, the options are limitless, right? And um, even with Apple's USB chip wouldn't have like any, you know, remotely usable like vulnerabilities. Um, if give it like a couple of months, and I think Thomas was working for that like for quite a while, um, you will always get in, right? Uh, one way or the other. Um, it's, it's not it's not military grade hardware, how I tend to say, right? So it's kind of like, um, it, it, it is expected, right? If you throw enough time and money and resources at the problem, it, you you will always always succeed with physical attacks most of the time. Um, right. If you then, you know, and then potentially yeah. you know use the device. I mean, if you compromise a single device, that's one thing. But the problem, yeah. as Dennis pointed out, is potentially you can get you know the information needed from that single device to compromise a whole you know yeah. installation, right? A whole you know so companies. 
I, I don't get the sense that secure development, you know, zero trust are concepts that are, you know, rooted in many of these device makers, you know, uh, thinking about how to deploy, how to design and then deploy their devices. You know, it's a very kind of black box, like, well, if, you know, nobody really knows how these things work. And so I think we're good, you know, and it's like, well, the, there the, are people the like that. Yeah. The, the, the bigger problem in a way, and this is like what I see quite often, um, people are surprised like what kind of things have actually firmware on them. So if yeah. you do like a security test, like of a company, of a bank, for example, you know, you look into, into software, you look into the ATMs, you look into maybe surveillance cameras, but things like door locks or like safe locks and some other things like temperature sensors in your office, uh, they are kind of regarded as infrastructure, like, you know, they're there for whatever reason, right? So no one ever or like rarely ever kind of looks into that and kind of thinks like, okay, what happens if these are compromised? Um, what kind of information can be used? Like, you know, you remember the whole thing with the Nest um, thermostat, which has a microphone yeah. in it. So people are kind of like not aware, but infrastructure is actually also interesting for us as attackers, right? So, um, you know, the, the you might have seen um, in uh, um, some places you have like the, uh, big robots, um, which kind of collect like uh, trays and like you know plates and everything, you know, like drive around. But there's the same robots also, which are kind of cleaning the floor, right? I mean, bigger vacuum robots basically, and they have lots of cameras and microphones. But people see them as infrastructure, so they might have like some confidential talks while yeah. this thing is driving by. And right. it's just the the awareness that's kind of missing. I think um, we know that software is insecure. We know that computers are insecure, but we not necessarily think about like, oh, what about the you know, 20 year old thermostat, which is like somewhere or a light controller or something. Just because it looks dumb doesn't mean that it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you know, th another big theme in this year is Black Hat, and I'm sure you both no noticed it was, of course, artificial intelligence um, and both the risks and rewards of AI and machine learning as regards cybersecurity. And um, I went to a couple talks. Um, I went to uh, Michael Bargery's talk of Zenity, uh, who was talking about Copilot and uh, the way they were able to, um, you know, some research they did on manipulating Copilot um, in order to get it to disclose all kinds of really interesting information. Um, there were other talks that were kind of more on the pro, pro, on the pro side, you know, using AI to help, you know, uh, discover vulnerabilities and stuff like that. Um, you guys are both very experienced cybersecurity professionals. I'm interested if you checked out at any of those AI focused talks and um, if and regardless, kind of what's your take on what where we where we are right now as an industry in regard to this emergent and incredibly powerful technology, Patrick. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think it's interesting because it's a topic that is kind of new in the sense it's super trendy, super buzzwordy. And there's, I think people are on all shades of the spectrum in terms of like what this means, uh, the risks and the rewards, right? Everyone's like, oh, this is like Skynet happening, Terminator stuff. And others are like, this isn't even artificial intelligence. And so um, you know, what I like to focus on is kind of like how it's useful in, in, in seeing that. And, you know, there's a lot of research how AI can be used to help, for example, medical professionals read, uh, you know, x-rays or MRIs to look for mm -hmm. potentially uh, cancers or injuries or that kind of stuff. And I, I mentioned that because I think there's parallels in the benefit of using uh, this AI in, in cybersecurity. So, for example, I've seen some research where people are basically... Um, using it to help detect malware. And so, uh, you know, you, the idea is maybe you get a lot of malicious samples and good samples, and then, you know, you have some machine, machine learning or AI to basically help pick out characteristics or things that look malicious, and then you can kind of uh, use that maybe to help detect previously un unknown malware. Um, obviously, it can be useful to write some code. You know, a lot of times if I need to whip out a proof of concept, um, you know, maybe I'm thinking up a new detection mechanism before I sit down and write it all, I can have chat GPT write some stuff. So I think like there's some, um, you know, I'm kind of thinking currently that there's some benefits to it. Currently now though, it seems very supplemental um, in the sense that, you know, it's it's not quite there yet. And is it one of these things like self-driving cars where like getting to 80, 90% is easy and then it's really the last 10% that's super difficult and, you know, it's going to take a very long time, but that last 10% is 
super, super important. Um, and so I'm kind of like on the fence where I see some use cases now. I think it can really supplement and help out, uh, you know, with some some basic tasks. Uh, but I have found that, you know, you ask like difficult questions that really starts falling apart because a lot of these, you know, um, AI solutions currently, they're just kind of regurgitating information in a way. Uh, and so like, I don't think quite yet they're actually coming up with novel solutions or, you know, if no one knows the answer, it's unsurprising if they will give you, especially a lot of times they just start uh, hallucinating. Um, but that having been said, I think a lot of talks were very interesting. Uh, the co-pilot one was interesting because what I think is that was an example of where Microsoft, and I already picked on Apple, so I can pick on Microsoft here, you know, basically it was like, AI, let's capitalize this. Let's like make these AI computer co-pilot, blah, 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 blah. You know, this will sell more computers. The stock will go up. The marketing team is stoked. And then like from a security and privacy point of view, you're like, wait a minute, this is actually a horrible idea. It's like, you know, and, and it seems like the way they rushed to implement that really didn't take into account security or more importantly, privacy here. Whereas, you know, the co-pilot would basically collect everything uh your private conversations and your credit card pins and then would just be like sitting on disk and like malware and attacker could basically just be like oh thanks for collecting all that like i'll be interested in that and so it was like a huge step back actually and so i think that's really one of the things we be, should be discussing is just these buzzwordy things when you know marketing or sales kind of jumps on it's like okay yeah well, what cost? and so uh, you know, unfortunately, that, that hype curve, that, hype yeah, curve. yeah. And I like Dennis kind of touched on ready, you know, IOT, it's usually they're rushing to market. They're focusing on features. Security is like an afterthought. And like in these AI systems, we got to make sure that we don't repeat that same mistake. And I think Copilot is a great case study of like how to actually do it completely wrong, uh, which, you know, maybe we can use that as a learning experience. And so moving forward, we'll, uh, I mean, one of the points that, that Michael made when my, my, talk to him as well and and his in his talk was you know one of the reasons we're focusing on copilot is like this is technology that is being rolled out at the largest you know wealthiest Everywhere. countries in in the on the globe like unlike you know most technology adoption like those big wealthy companies are are laggards you know they're not out in front on this they're going to wait and see like but seemingly with ai that's all gone out the window and companies are yeah. just plowing into it and as he would point out not really thinking through the security privacy you know integrity um implications of that um so very interesting dennis thoughts on ai um <laughs> i think i think right now we are kind of like in, on a hype train so in a way that uh you know you know if you have a company uh, and you don't do anything with AI, then basically uh, you will not get investor money. So that's why everyone tries to do AI and some other stuff. Yeah. And as Patrick said, I mean, if we, the, the companies most of, most of the time don't even understand what they kind of do and don't know the implications of that, right? So they kind of try to um, move, move out a product which does something. And most of the time they don't understand themselves what, what it does, but it kind of like, you know, uh, they claim like, oh, we have now AI uh, in, in a product. And I see it kind of critical because uh, it kind of um, adds like trust of people into AI, which is a dangerous thing. Um, and I have like just a quick story in general, like secure coding. Um, when I was teaching the software vulnerability class at Northeastern, uh, we like students who we, were using ChatGPT to kind of generate like payloads for like a buffer overflow. And uh, the task was like, you need to have like 300 A's or something or 300 bytes of, of something in the, in the payload to kind of override the buffer. And they said like, uh, we asked ChatGPT for like, to do that and they said like yeah it doesn't work and i'm looking at it i'm like this is like way more than 300 right? it was like uh and they said like no no chat gpt said it's like 300 and it's like chat gpt is true so what we did is like we copied it out and turned out to be like 2500 it doesn't <laughs> it wasn't even like close to, to 300 you look at the thing it's like half of the screen is full of like something and, like this is no way it's it's like it's like 300 but uh and people were like oh no but chat gpt said that is yeah. the case um, and we shouldn't forget that, you know, ChatGPT and other AI systems, uh, they train on things like Stack Overflow, which doesn't give you like the most, you know, quality, quality code, code. <laughs> and like, in, especially for crypto and uh, for other things. I remember it was like a paper where they said like, oh, uh, analyze basically like how secure products, which kind of rely, uh, where, where developers were looking at uh, Stack Overflow for security advice. 
and surprisingly it's not very secure and my feeling is Echovax at some point was also doing the same thing where what well, that's one of the reasons why we have like you know w get dash dash no certificate check uh because we were probably annoyed by SSL errors so we just disabled it in a way uh so there's a lot of like uh things where uh, people rely on AI and I think I personally think it's dangerous and I, I, in my feeling, it will probably or hopefully blow over like the same trend like we had a couple of years ago of Zero Trust, uh, a couple of years ago of XDR, with whatever. It's like, it's, there's always like this trends like every couple of years. And, you know, for me, as sometimes as an attacker, it's like kind of funny if you see, to basically bypass products and just like, um, you know, I wouldn't say mop the floor with them, but, you know, you know, like sometimes I saw in reality, like when I was doing like uh, red team things, um, products which I saw at Black Hat in the uh, expo booth uh, in the expo hall basically and it's like an interesting feeling you know like wait shouldn't that trigger right now but no it didn't uh so you can't trust too much you still need like uh, people who understand what we're doing and who can see like signs of like oh this looks like weird um so I should investigate that which AI wouldn't do most of the time yeah um yeah really uh, really good insights there I mean I think you know, we're kind of coming up on the end of our session uh, in, in about 10 minutes. Um, final kind of big theme, I would say, and Patrick, you kind of brought up CrowdStrike earlier. I think CrowdStrike kind of falls under this umbrella, which is um, kind of supply chain risk that organizations are struggling with now, especially given the real increase in the complexity of of software technology supply chains that organizations are relying on. There were a lot of talks and, and, and discussions I felt around just the struggles of organizations kind of understanding their risk exposure, especially with the embrace of, you know, cloud computing and, you know, these kind of cloud to cloud integrations and, uh, you know, obviously AP, you know, kind of no code applications, you know, with APIs, but like not really understanding fully, like what the risks inherent in the API are and like what data, you know, a malicious actor might be able to use to get, get them, get out of them. Um, and then there's CrowdStrike, right? Which is, you know, again, you know, kind of an example of it wasn't a malicious attack. It was just a bad update, but, you know, organizations are in the habit of just, you know, especially with security, right? Just just mainlining those updates, getting them out as fast as they can, keeping that patch window small. Um, and but huge kind of downside to that when it's a compromise update or a bad update. Um, what um, I'm interested in your thoughts, um, you know, particularly on the sort of, you know, especially on the API issue and the and the dependency issue. Um, it seems to me like we're, we're there's a little bit of a a gap, a little bit of a that we're as an industry kind of catching up with where many enterprises are in terms of their tech in, e infrastructure and and how they're actually using and accessing you know data and and so on. Definitely, I, I like that Dennis mentioned that one of the risks that these IoT devices present is people don't necessarily realize they're there that you know the robot taking your dishes away can be like spying or someone could have implanted like your door lock because it's basically a computer with firmware um i mentioned that because i think there's a similar problem in enterprises or even in software application packages not understanding the complexity and the dependencies that are involved and Paul, i like the image of supply chain attacks because these are one of the things that really not keeps me up at night, but almost does because <laughs> I sleep pretty well. But like, you know, we have seen examples of just the impact that they have. And, you know, traditionally or more commonly, these impacted Windows. But, you know, the last year or so, we've seen very sophisticated nation state adversaries target software that impacts Mac OS as well. And so I'm more familiar with those can speak to that. And so, for example, we have the 3CX. It's a very popular PBX software used in a lot of uh, uh, enterprises around the world. Uh, basically, North Korean adversaries got access to the 3CX network, were able to surreptitiously modify the Windows and Mac OS updates. Uh, for Mac OS, they then sent them to Apple. <laughs> Apple inadvertently notarized and approved them, which uh, that's very, very problematic. And then basically pushed them out to users around the world. And, 
you know, we pick on users a lot because we're often like, ah, oh, there's Odom, they're clicking on stuff and like turning off security features. And yeah, there's definitely areas where users could be uh, uh, improve their security posture, but supply chain attacks, one of the reasons they're so worrisome is the user is really doing nothing wrong. They're getting an update from a trusted source and, you know, there's essentially nothing they can do. Also, the detection of it is very, very difficult, uh, you know, because it's coming from a trusted source. Maybe it's notarized by Apple. Uh, and so the impact, the stealth, all those things make the supply chain stuff really difficult. And, you know, I develop software too. And so I try to be super cognizant about what dependencies it has. And, you know, but still I'm like, man, if someone compromised, you know, the backend infrastructure where the tools are, right, that would be super problematic. And so that's one of the reasons I, I really like what Reversing Labs is doing, where it's, I think, realizing the risks that supply chain attacks pose and also understanding how difficult they are to detect. And so, you know, some of the work you're doing, detecting if updates have been surreptitiously modified, working with community partners for that is is incredible because, yeah, really supply chain attacks, uh, I think are potentially one of the most damaging uh, yeah. attacks and adversaries okay. know that. And so they're really like ramping up time and effort on that. And, and just to kind okay. of circle that back because of all these dependencies that, software has, especially in the enterprise, like there's just so many venues, avenues for supply chain attacks. It makes it even more worrisome. Right. And I mean, it, it really is sort of like broadening the conversation, right? It's not just about, is there an RCE? Is there a known CVE in that software? It's also you know, as with, you know, the 3CX, is that software, has it changed from the last version? And, you know, is, is there behavior in here that doesn't, you know, line up with what's supposed to be in there or is it be, you know is is there something unusual about this that falls short of being a cve or but is something that should ask you know warrant us to push back a little bit on the vendor or take a deeper look ourselves um and that's a that's a much higher bar than most companies you know put in place right now right which yeah. is I mean, honestly that's We've been conditioned for years to just be like, hey man, if there's a software update, you know, get it, get yeah, it in right. there. Which is still a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. it is, unless it isn't, right? I mean, that's, you know. I but... like that you mentioned the CrowdStrike example because that was just a faulty update. But like, if that was a supply chain attack, oh my goodness. I mean, like, right. I'm just showing you the breadth of where CrowdStrike was. I'm sure a lot of adversaries are like, Hmm, wow, I wish, you know, we could get in CrowdStrike. And again, if you get in one in one point, then you could just hit all these systems. So it's it's really like uh so that's Tyson, that worry more than this AI stuff. <laughs> yeah. Tyson, one of our attendees, has a question, which is I would love to understand if organizations have started to understand single points of failure or if this is something that might not have even been on the radar before CrowdStrike. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think they, my, my guess would be they understand it in concept, but they probably have not gone through the process of actually applying it to their own environments. I don't know, Dennis or Patrick, what you think? Um, I think CrowdStrike kind of showed everyone that, um, how BitLocker actually works and where that you should maybe take a look, quick look where your BitLocker keys are kind of stored. Uh, uh, yeah, it's like a, I feel many people don't understand, like, uh, you know, they, they kind of see the, the bigger picture, like we have the service around there, we have like decent software in, in place, but they don't see like lower, lower things where like, oh, okay, there's like this, this is one faulty Windows update, which kind of triggers like the BitLocker encryption. Where do we have the key? Oh, it's on that server. Wait, the server is also encrypted. So, you know, there's a lot of like kind of things where people just don't uh, think generally like okay what can go wrong and how can we restore for that same for backups right i mean it's, it's like it, it's like, a decade, decade old problem where people don't just there's it's like most of the time people kind of pray oh nothing will ever happen and everything will be fine uh or someone else will take care of that but uh, it's always like a very dangerous assumption uh i don't see right. how this will change in the future sadly i know yeah, patrick and... has like a different feeling about that <laughs> No, I agree. I mean, it's like I'm always a little pessimistic now in the sense that I think that um, exactly what Dennis said, where it's like uh, it's, it's 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 nuanced and like how much will actually change. Uh, you know, it's like this, I think pointed out the fact that, for example, a widely widespread um, kernel driver can wreak havoc on the world's systems. 
And, you know, it's, uh, you know, what's going to be done about that? <laughs> I mean, I think companies will hopefully test their updates uh, better before rolling them out globally. Um, but in terms of like, you know, kicking third party kernel extensions out of the Windows kernel, like, I don't think that's happening anytime soon, yeah. unfortunately. Um, okay. Um, so for, you know, we're running out of time here. Um, a couple of little housekeeping biz, uh, matters before we go. First of all, um, we have, uh, some copies of, um, uh, Patrick of your book, the art of Mac malware to give away five copies. Um, and, uh, so for folks, uh, we are going to be, um, giving out, uh, sending a link if you're a, a winner, um, five lucky attendees, and you're going to be notified uh, early next week. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'll throw in the link to, um, to Amazon for this book in case you want to check it out. Um, so that's something. And the other thing would be, uh, I'm having some issues kind of sharing the desktop, but I, so I'm going to have to just kind of talk you through this, but we've got some, uh, additional webinars coming up, uh, August 27, uh, 22nd. Uh, we've got a webinar, Don't Stop at the S-Bomb, uh, How to Take Your Software Supply Chain Security to the Next Level, uh, and kind of title kind of speaks for itself. Um, September 11th, I'm going to be talking with my colleagues and co-authors of a book we just put out, Software Supply Chain Security for Dummies. So you can check that out and join us. You'll get a copy of the uh, Software Supply Chain Security for Dummies and also get to hear from me and Charlie and Ashley uh, about that book. Uh, and just because Black Hat is over doesn't mean the swag offers have to be. If you didn't attend, which we know 97% of you didn't, uh, and didn't snag one of our coveted anti-hack backpacks at Black Hat, you still have a chance, uh, the first 10 people, uh, to have a meeting with our experts to discuss their software supply chain strategy will receive one by mail. And um, we will uh, throw those into... Um, the chat. Um, but with that, I wanted to uh, thank Dennis and Patrick so much for coming on, talking through Black Hat with us. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, man, there's a lot to talk about, uh, but I think we I think we did a pretty good job. Um, thank you both so much, and we'll be sure to have you back. Thank you, Paul, and all the attendees for attending. Really appreciate uh, Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Absol it's, it's always great to talk about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hey, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, Patrick, Dennis, thank you so much. We'll have you all back and uh, and take care. All right. Bye. All right.